All right, guys, let's get started. Um, the topic for today's lecture is information diffusion and influence maximization. So today we're going to talk about the topic of the diffusion of information and um, how it relates to decision making. And of course, uh, we're going to be talking about all those on graphs. So, you know, there is an interesting discussion uh, around uh, the, the, the differences in propagation process, whether we're thinking about the information propagation versus um, the influence, because the influence is really uh, a decision-making process um, versus, you know, information, you just can accept it the same way as, for example, you know, vir virus, and uh, you know you 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 kind of don't have a control over it. You know you got information. You 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 heard about some news, um, whether you want it or not. You know the the information was delivered to you. Versus, um, this is a scenario when you're actually um, actively making a decision, right? And the decision can be like adopting innovation, or maybe you know switching to a different. You know, cell phone provider, you know, switching technologies, uh, making particular purchase, et cetera, et cetera. And in both cases, your whether it's about decision or whether it's about you know obtaining information, um, the your network surrounding your connections can play a significant role. And in fact, uh, one can show that there are some particular local rules or local decisions can actually lead to very different global results in terms of the results for the entire network. And so people say that microscopic changes can actually lead to macroscopic sort of large, the, the network scale results. So we're gonna start by looking at the model that is proposed by economists, and then we'll go into computer science world and look into um, influence maximization model. Uh, again, the story of, of the, you know, the fusion of innovation uh, goes back, the, the theory goes back to 40s and with their experiment, the so-called so, so Ryan Gross study of hybrid seed corn delayed adoption. So the idea is that they, you know, there was a new type of corn um, and, and uh, uh, you know, farmers um, knew about it, but they wouldn't use it until their neighbors would start using it. And so because of that, there were actually two waves in adoption. I mean, the two waves that happened. One wave is a wave of propagation of information. So people were informed. And the second wave of actually uh, uh, action, right? On or accepting this, this innovation. And so, but, you know, of course, innovation, you know, the information about innovation happened at the same time as, as innovation was proposed. And so that really means these are two different mechanisms that are responsible for information versus, say, um, uh, the, the action, right? The adopt, adoption of innovation, which is, um, which is an action. So there are different mechanisms that are responsible for, for those propagations. So if you look at this, Imagine, uh, you know, here we have a, a small graph. Um, if you think about information propagation, it is like virus. It is very similar to the model that we studied before when we looked like, for example, with SIR or SIS model, all those viral models. But the propagation can flow across the links uh, easily. And, uh, you know, the, the person who gets that information getting sort of infected with it, right? Um, alternatively, if you think about actionable or, or a particular action, the person might act only if some of the neighbors acts, right? And so that means you, sh you, know, the, you, you, will, you will need some critical number of friends before you join them. And so that means that changes completely, that changes dramatically the, the, the picture. And so we're going to look at this for a moment at this scenario where um, you need uh, a few people, you know, with, when, when you have a threshold for accepting some, um, uh, for adopting, for accepting innovation. 
Um, and you know, one of the first scenarios, ways to, to look at this coming actually from, again, from economics and um, with the concept of so-called network coordination game, where you do have a network and there are players, and it's, it's sort of, it's, it's a part of the game theory. And uh, um, there are different strategies, which is accept or not accept innovation or sort of accept, not accept an offer. Say, for example, from a, from a mobile operator to switch. Um, and uh, then there are payoffs. And payoffs meaning that, uh, you know, you, you can get some benefit from this. And the idea is that if you have uh, two uh, users, two nodes in the graph that are ready to adopt particular behavior, they get some payoff. Is they both adopt some, some, some other behavior, they get a different payoff. And if they adopt sort of opposite behaviors, they get zero payoff. Now, think about it this way, you know, say, you know, you and, 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 and your friend um, selecting, uh, for example, which technological platform to use, you know, app for, um, Apple versus uh, Windows, right? And if you're both using the same technological platform, you can exchange, for example, experience or exchange software. Now, depending on the technological platform, you know, it can be better or worse, but um, if you have the same, then you're benefiting from it. And if you have, uh, you know, different platforms, you, you, you one select strategy A and the other select strategy B, you know, you, you, you're not getting any payoff from this. Or, you know, the mobile operators, all of them offering discounts from for the calls within the network. And let's say you and your friend um, both, you know, joining, like say MTS, you get some particular discount for them, for both of you being on the, on the network. Um, or you both joining, say, um, I don't know, Tele2 uh, operator, you, you both get discount for being in the same network. But if you're in different networks, you don't have any discounts. So um, that's a payoffs if you're coordinating your actions. And that's why it's called coordination game. And so now let's add on, on, onto this, onto this uh, picture. Let's add the network. And, and then... Um, you can think about, you know, user, and in this case, it's a user V, and, uh, you know, it has some neighbors and, uh, you know, some neighbors, some friends accepting particular strategy A and some accepting particular strategy B. Now, if um, the payoff for both strategies is the same, then, um, you know, the, for, for V to decide what to do, of course, it will just choose a majority strategy. In this case, you know, it would be B. But if the payoffs are different, then you know it should be a sort of simple ratio of the payoffs that will allow the user to select the right strategy. So you know if there's a portion of of friends, um, or, you know, of using um, strategy of type type A, and the portion is P, and the payoff is A uh, little, then it is A P times you know number of connections um, should be bigger than sort of the other side, right, of the equation. And that will be the threshold for accepting um, the behavior, right? So, I mean, overall, it just really means that, um, you know, the, accepting the behavior uh, of, of part of the uh, neighborhood, um, you know, is, 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 depends on, you know, the payoff for that behavior, the relative payoff, compared to accepting some other behavior, right? And this is this payoff is um, uh, also modulated by, you know, the, the, the number of uh, friends going for one or another behavior. So, but that leads to a very interesting effect. Um, if we're thinking only about a single person decision-making, then we pretty much solve the problem, right? But then the question is like, what, you know, we have a network. And so we can actually see um, the potential chain reaction in this network. When there is one user that is uh, making particular decision, but then um, there are other neighbors that whose behavior will be affected by this person's decision. Um, for example, um, let's look at this slide. And let's assume we have two initial sort of adopters of a new behavior, nodes V and W. It's the first row on the right. So those two new adopters. Um, then 
um, let's see, we, let's say we have a particular threshold for this new behavior. And you know, if there are payoffs, you know, simple example like equal to three and b equal to two, threshold is 250. And so what happens is in this uh, very simplistic scenario, we have, um, let me draw here, you know, we have those, these two guys, sort of the initial, um, you know, the, the, the new behavior, and then they have neighbors, they have this neighbor, um, this neighbor, this neighbor, and this neighbor. But what happens is for the neighbor R, there are actually two neighbors out of three, right? It's two thirds that are, uh, you know, uh, that, that are accepted this new behavior. And so it's one third neighbor S did not. And so for R, it would make sense to switch because the threshold here is two fifth. Right, so two thirds will bigger than two fifth. But if we look at this guy, it's only one out of three neighbors who adopted a new behavior. And so for this guy, it, it does make sense to switch at this moment. So following this, this, this um, idea, what we see is that if we start initially with these two nodes, um, adopting new behavior, then on the next iteration, they'll be joining by these two guys because you know it would make sense for those guys to join, right? Based on our calculations. But then what happens is the scenario changes for this guy. Right here, based on our cal based on our threshold calculations, the node S shouldn't be joining, you know, the two other nodes because it's only one node, node W, that was that, that was having this new behavior. But, and sort of this is how we go on the iterations, right? Um, but now there are two neighbors, R and W, that have this new behavior. And so it's only one neighbor that is you that have all behavior. So now for S, it makes sense to switch. And so what happens is, this chain reaction happens, and for a node, there are more and more neighbors switching the behavior, and so nodes will switch the behavior eventually. So such a way, um, this new, you know, sort of adoption of innovation happens, or 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 this change of behavior can actually propagate through the network. Now, uh, how far would it go? Well, um, we can actually continue. Sort of investigating this, um, the, the, this this game, and we can quickly realize that this type of you know the, the spread, the, the the depth or the, the the breadth of the of the influence of the spread of the influence depends on, of course, on the thresholds. And if we look and analyze this picture, like larger graph, you can see that. With the given thresholds, the influence will not be able to actually go, go uh, further than this neighborhood. Why? Well, because again, as, as we have previously observed, for example, for the node number two, it has only one node, which is not number six that switch behavior and it has node one and three, of all behavior. And so for the node two, it doesn't make sense to switch its behavior. And so the influence will not enter you know, this, this group of nodes. And by the same reason, it will not be able to enter this group either. And so the influence will get stopped or stuck in, in this area, right? In this area of the drop. So in fact, you notice that it is, when they are within the cluster, it will sort of remain within the cluster and it will not spread out. If, again, we are talking about this sort of threshold type of a model where in order for somebody to make a decision, it needs the neighbors to, to, to already sort of adopt this innovation, right? And so then it will be motivated to, to make the decision. If we were looking into like SIR type of like virus or information spread model, that would not be the case. We'll have We'll, we'll have like very, very smooth, uh, you know, propagation across um, the entire graph. 
So threshold models in the sense behaving differently, you know, they allow us to have this chain reaction in propagation of decisions, but that propagation can be stopped in the graph due to the graph structure. So switching gears a little bit um, and going into more math, um, there are sort of two models has been proposed for um, influence propagation. And, you know, here we can talk about, uh, about you know, uh, ad adoption of innovation or influence response, sort of it's all, it's all the same. So there are two models, one called um, independent cascade model, and the other one is called linear threshold model, critical mass model. So, you know, what we talked about a second ago is really this critical mass model. So the idea is that in order for a node uh, in the graph to switch to a new behavior, right? To respond to an influence, right? That's why it's influence response. Uh, it needs some critical number of neighbors to respond to that influence. And then, uh, I mean, to, to, to push that, to give this influence, right? And, and then when um, the threshold is crossed, then the node switches. So again, if in this case, um, there is some threshold, some parameter, and you know, as soon as uh, within the neighborhood, the fraction of the nodes switches the behavior, this node will switch the behavior. This is called linear threshold model or critical math model. Alternative model is independent cascade model or model of diminishing returns. The idea here is that the influence is, uh, you know, there is some probability of, of node to, you know, to get influenced and that um, the total influence probability uh, depends on, you know, the, the probabilities from, of influence from each node. And so if P is a probability of influence for each node, one minus P is a probability that it's not gonna influence and one minus one to this, to the power N is a probability that at least uh, you know, within N, uh, there will be an influence on 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 your node, and it's diminishing returns because um, you know the more nodes um, can influence your node, of course, the higher the probability that it will get activated, but it saturates eventually. So these are the two models. Linear threshold and dependent cascade model. What's interesting that in a, you know a little bit of, of large networks, um, eventually the behavior for these models will be quite similar. So, you know, let's talk about those models in terms of like you know details because this is what we're going to study. So, independent cascade model, right? This probabilistic model of diminishing returns. The way it operates is the following. You we first start with some initial set of active nodes, right? Those nodes, as we've seen on the previous slides, you know, that, that activated. And then we have discrete time steps running. And on every step, an active node can activate connected neighbor with some probability. This probability can, you know, depend on the weight on the edge, um, or it can be, you know, constant across entire network. But you know, if if it is depending on the weight on the edge, you would call it P V W, and there is a single chance for a node to activate its neighbor. If it activates, the node becomes active. Good. And then process runs until no more activations possible, right? When every node tried to activate its neighbor. Now, if, if there is a scenario when all those probabilities on every edge are the same, then we're actually, this model is equivalent to a particular type of SIR model where node stays infected only for one step. Because see, in this model, we're allowing it 
to try to activate its, its neighbor only um, has only single chance to do it, right? And then this is becoming this SIR model that we talked about you know, a few lectures ago. So this is this independent cascade model. Again, the point here is it's a probabilistic model and um, you know, every node can activate its neighbor with some probability P that depends on the weight on an edge connecting you with this node. With the linear threshold model, it's slightly different. Remember, it's a linear threshold. The idea that influence comes from the nearing na nearest neighbors also, but in order for a node to be activated, the sum of the influences has to exceed some threshold. Now, for example, we can say the threshold is one, and so the, the sum of the influences has to be greater than one, or, uh, I'm sorry, or, or uh, greater than some, some threshold, right? Um, you know, if one it is, you know, it means all, all the all the nodes need to 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 influence the particular node in order for it to to convert. Now that's the extreme case. Um, typically, we set up some threshold, which is of course less than one. And what we need for activation to happen is that the fraction of the nodes exceed the threshold. So this is a really the model we have discussed. Um, at the beginning of the lecture, right, on those simple examples with game theory. And, and so the idea, again, you have an active node, uh, or actually you have several active nodes at the beginning, and then they activate other nodes. And so it is also a sort of progressive process. Um, in these models, we do not deactivate nodes. There is always sort of, with every step, we get more and more nodes um, activated. You can think about this again as you know people trying to switch from one mobile operator to another, or maybe you know thinking about the effect of advertising. Now, with these models, we can actually observe some quite interesting properties um, on on, our, on the um, you know artificial graphs. Um, you know, one of the graphs we studied a long time ago now is a, is a random network, and if you remember, the random network um, has a parameter. Um, that controls um, the density of the network. And that parameter, in fact, also um, uh, controls the existence of um, connected components, right? And so-called gigantic connected component. Um, here, this parameter is called Z. And uh, just to remind you, when Z, uh, which is you know, the, the average node degree you know, over the graph, that's a parameter, right? When it exceeds one, you start getting gigantic connected components. So you can get from every node to any other node. And when it's getting, you know, larger and larger, the graph getting denser and denser and more and more connected. So here, um, so, you know, if we look at the vertical axis, these are more and more dense and denser type of graphs. On the horizontal axis, we have a threshold uh, for uh, our um, threshold model, right? Um, and, and um, you know, if we have a particular threshold, what happens is, of course, um, you know, when, when we are under, when the average node degree is below one, so we're somewhere here, there is no cascades possible sort of cascade again, it's a it's, uh, bunch of nodes being converted. So there's no cascades possible simply because the graph is disconnected. But what's interesting is that we're also getting a scenario of no cascades right there, though the graph is very well connected, right? When every node has, you know, here 10 degrees on average or 12 degrees on average or 14 degrees on average node degree. So graphs are very well connected, but we still don't get any cascades. And the reason for that is remember, for cascade to happen, you still you need to have you know some fraction of your neighbors uh, being converted, and then you know the node will be converted. But the thing is, if the graph is dense and you have a lot of neighbors, it's actually hard to get a large fraction of neighbors converted. And so the very dense graphs is actually also a problem for this type of um, 
propagation for this for this cascade to happen. And so surprise, you know, interestingly enough, you get this sort of shape um, that corresponds to to you know to the region where you actually get a global cascade. Global cascade means the entire network will be converted, you know, to to say new behavior. And uh, you know, on, on on the right hand side, there is this where we instead of instead of just uh, you know sort of uh, fixed threshold, we get a distribution, and so you know it creates a much smoother boundary. But the point remains the same. So you 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 don't get cascades, um, you know, in the case of of uh, very dense graphs, and and that happens because you don't get a lot of neighbors that already converted, and so that uh, influence cannot propagate. So you do need to have connections, but you have a lot of connections that can stop the the propagation of of uh, information, the propagation of influence, the cascade. Okay, so if we look at the picture here, um, you know we can have a scenario. You know this is simulation on some empirical network and randomized networks, and you know you might have actually different results depending on on which nodes. Um, are selected as initial seeds. If you notice um, the, the graphs B and C, some, some sort of randomized network, um, but depending on the seed, in the case of, in the case of the selection of the nodes on, on, on um, example C, um, the entire graph is getting, uh, getting the cascade, right? And, and, and getting uh, adopted, right? Converted, but, on a, on, a, on a picture B, on the image B, you don't get that. And so, and, and, and it's quite of, kind of you know, natural, right? Because you might have uh, scenarios, you might have nodes that are positioned a certain way within the network that will help propagation of the influence and others that will not. And so that brings us to actually a, uh, the, the the problem set up we want to talk about today about this influence maximization, and so the idea is is quite straightforward. The idea is how to select the nodes that will maximize the influence across the network. So maximizing the influence will means you know will will be if we select these particular nodes, then through this chain process eventually some number of nodes in the network will be converted. And so we want to figure out which nodes to choose as a seed nodes to get the maximum size of the converted set at the end of the process. You know, in some sense, you can think about this as a marketing campaign where you want to select a few, uh, you know, nodes, a few people in the social network to give maybe some discounts to convert them you know, into your, say, mobile operator or, or whatever product usage, and then see uh, and try to predict how much of other network user, users they will affect, right? They will be able to convert. And this is not just, again, uh, it's not just the number of con connections you know, on, on, a, on a, uh, step one, step two, step three um, away. This actually takes into account the potential of the users to affect other users, right? And like we just saw in the previous slides, it's not necessarily the most connected users that will um, do the best. Okay, so formally, the influence maximization problem is the following. We have initial set of active nodes and we can calculate the cascade size. Cascade size is the expected number of active nodes when propagation stops. And so what we want to do is we want to find a case set of nodes, of initial nodes that produce maximum, maximal cascade size. And this is called maximum influence nodes. And that's what we want to solve. Now, this problem is actually in PHAR. Um, as many other problems on graphs, um, you know, there, there, there's like a factorially large number of, you know, it's a combinatorial problem. And there's a factorially large number of combinations you need to try to actually solve this problem, right? You know, if you think about this, like sort of in general, you would say, okay, fine, you know, we can calculate the propagation, we'll pick up one node, calculate, you know, define how far, um, how much, you know, it will affect the graph. Okay, then we'll take two nodes, 
but taking two nodes already so taking one node is um, you know one out of n right so you have to do n times but if you want two nodes it's c2 out of n which is uh, n times n minus one um, options right and then uh, if you want three nodes it's n n time minus three etc cetera, etc cetera. and so you'll have to go through all of those possible combinations to actually calculate this and you know that's what makes it MP hard um but the good news you know it was in PR problems you usually don't try to solve them you know directly because again it's it's just a factorial large number of combinations you need to go but um there are ways to deal with you know with, with type of problems usually these are like sort of approximation or greedy algorithms and the good news that you know in in a case of uh influence optimization uh, there is a greedy strategy that actually works to learn that we we need to learn what submodular functions are. Now, submodular function is a type of a function that is defined for the sets. And this is a function of diminishing returns, which means if you have a set um, and you measure some sort of function on top of it, right? And then you add a new additional element to the set, the function will increase, we would like it to be monotonously growing. But the catch here is that if your initial set is small, adding every adding additional element to the set will increase the value of the function more than if we add one additional element to a larger set. So formally, you know, if we have two sets, um, S and 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 uh, in, and S is subset of T, right? Then um, what we do is the, the function will be some modular if adding um, element, additional element to a smaller subset will provide more effect than to a larger. If it were not, you know, sets, but just numbers, real numbers, then we would be just, just talking of the sort of concave function, right? where um, again adding taking a smaller set and adding uh, additional element to it actually causes more effect than taking a larger set and adding additional element so why do we, why are we talking about this uh, submodular functions well because of a submodular function there is a very interesting theorem exists and the theorem that if you have a monotone submodular function and uh, you know we know that exists a set that can achieve the maximum of that function, then if we do a greedy optimization by doing iteration and including the elements that produce the large and largest marginal increase on in every iteration, we can actually get to within one minus one over E of uh, the true maximal solution. So one minus one over E is uh, approximately like 67. I think we'll, we'll see on the next slide, the actual number, but this is actually a pretty good result. So what it says is by doing greedy optimization, in this case, you can get to you know almost 70% um, of the real optimal solution. And optimal solution is NP hard. So you, know, you, you, you cannot just solve it computationally, not usually. Oh, that's okay. I said it's 70%. Uh, it's 62, right? 6 to 9, 0.63. So it has been shown that the cascade size is, in fact, a submodular function. And so, because of that, uh, you know, we can actually use the theorem and we can use this greedy algorithm to find um, the maximum influence set. Um, and, and, you know, when we find it, it's guaranteed that it is at least at least um, 0 0.63 right so 63 percent of the optimal solution so what's the algorithm it's it is a greedy algorithm so the idea is very simple so we we start you know let's say we have a uh, we want to find a, an influence set of particular size so what we're going to do is the following we just go and first you know go through all the nodes 
and for each node, calculate its influence. How do we calculate the influence? Well, we actually run a simulation, propagation simulation, and see, you know, measure the influence. So for each node, we do this. There are n nodes we do for all of them. We pick up the one that gives us maximum influence. We fix it. Then we, out of other n minus one nodes, we'll go through all of those n minus one nodes. And together with the first node, which is fixed, we will calculate the largest possible influence. Then we fix those two nodes, we add third node and do the same. And so uh, when you go through the case sets, the complexity of the algorithm will be like, okay, the first node is n times, the, the second node selection n minus one time, the third node is n minus two. So it is k times n iterations. And for every iterations, you will need to calculate the maximum um, influence. Versus if we were trying to solve the original problem, then we would have to go through all the possible combinations. And so it is not anymore like k times n, it's gonna be factorial large number because again, for one node, it's n times, for the two nodes, it's n squared, for three nodes, you know, it's approximately n cubed, et cetera, et cetera, um, number of combinations. And, and so this is a greedy algorithm. It doesn't give you this sort of hill climbing, right? In the sense that we are optimizing on every step, right? Um, but it gives you, you know, brings you sort of guaranteed theoretically to the 63% of the um, optimal possible result, which is actually pretty good. Now, the challenge with this algorithm is, of course, you know, typical to uh, even, you know, in, in this case, the, the problem is, is, is so, you know, the problem is difficult because of the size of the graph. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a second, but on this slide, you actually see both linear and independent cascade model for the graph of 10,000 nodes, 50,000 edges. And um, we can see um, the, the performance. So what you have on a X axis is number of nodes in a seed. So let's say we have selected 10 nodes and we're gonna calculate the maximum influence from those 10 nodes. And if we just do like random, you know, randomly pick up 10 nodes under those models, then on average, you know, it's going to affect, well, approximately 10 nodes, right? So it's not going to spread around. But if we do um, this greedy algorithm, which is the top one, you know, we can actually make it up to 40 nodes. We take it 20 initial nodes, you know, if randomly it's going to be somewhere here. But if we go on the greedy algorithm, we're going to get that way. Now, what's also interesting to observe is that um, there are other methods which are much easier, but can also give you pretty good results right here, for example. Now, these methods are uh, like this high degree or, or centrality. So when you select nodes based on those metrics and not just sort of, you know, randomly picking up nodes, but using, um, you know, the degree centrality to prioritize nodes. And um, there is like a lot of a lot of sort of improvements to those algorithms. There is this, you know, various greedy methods, obviously, um, and um, some methods that are, you know, computation intensive. Again, there is a different example. Uh, there is a set side, um, and and there is you know sort of the influence spread. And you notice um, the, this this particular paper actually was looking uh, at the computational efficiency of algorithms. And if you notice that though, you know, we have a, uh, you know, again, like the random, of course, before is, before the worst, but then there is a set of algorithms um, and there is set of computations, you know, computing efforts, uh, running time here. And notice um, that, of course, you know, when you go like sort of random or degree-based, you know, this is very um, quick because what you do is you just sort the nodes by no degree and just pick up the nodes with the largest degree or like random nodes. And anytime we do, um, you know, real greedy kind of algorithms, that's computationally still intensive. But then there is some algorithm, which is what's called here is the degree discount and, sing and, 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 and a single discount. They're still doing pretty good job in terms of performance. Um, and they're not very, they're less intensive, computationally intensive. Um, th those algorithms are based, for example, on the notion that 
instead of just uh, you know looking into um, you know random. I mean, in, 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 instead of just going through all the possible nodes when you when you calculate influence, um, we actually prioritize nodes by looking at node degrees, right? And in certain way, picking up nodes with high node degree or with a high centrality or sort of some other way that some sort of heuristic that helps us not to look through all the possible nodes, but just to select a few of, of the nodes to add to our test set for, for to check for the, the influence that they will um, provide, the size of the influence they will provide. So to sum up, um, you know, the problem itself is, um, you know, de defined on, on a graph, right? And um, um, we looked at the two types of this influence model, independent cascade model, where there is a probability that the, that, 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 the, that the influence will propagate from one node to another. And then a threshold model where um, there is a threshold for the number of nodes to be converted. And there are other models that are possible. So if you can set up different ideas. Now, when we want to solve those models, um, the base for those solution is this greedy um, algorithms, right? The greedy approximation. So the, the, the model of influence maximization is NP hard. Uh, factorially large number of computations. You cannot do it on large graphs. I mean, you can hardly do it on small graphs, but you can do an approximation and it's greedy approximation with, will bring you to 63%. Um, and, and that's sort of the basis for other algorithms. And then there are a lot and lots of algorithms that are built on top of it. Um, there's Monte Carlo simulation, which is type of simulation algorithms or pruning technique, which allows you to stop prune the solutions that are not good enough. Um, there is proxy based models, which is we use say page rank or we use um, you know some sort of methods of um, uh, some other methods like centrality metrics to actually uh, prioritize nodes and add nodes only with high centrality or, or high page rank um, to the influence consideration and, and or even just completely ignore this this whole notion of, of uh, you know computing the uh, computing the influence but just using the proxy and then sketch based algorithm where we actually change and look at the graphs um, from the different angle and just sketching the graph which is picking up subgraphs. Um, this has been a quite active area of research in the last 10 years. Um, on, on top of those methods, there is a new breed of methods. Um, we, we, we don't talk about it here, but if you're interested, there is a new set of methods that are based on um, graph neural networks and uh, embeddings, where you actually try to use node embeddings to predict um, the, 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 size, the size of the influence. Um, you can think about it as setting up as a supervised learning problem, right? And the node embeddings have, you know, they, they encode uh, information about graphs. And, and so, you know, you can try to build a, a model where you can actually predict um, the, the influence from the different combination of the nodes. And here is some references um, the, from, for, the, for the basic papers. Um, and with that, uh, we are done for today. Any questions? All right, so if there's no questions, um, there will be a seminar discussion um, in 20 minutes, I guess. And uh, over there, you will have a chance to actually um, write and execute the code for influence maximization. With that, we're done for today. Well, thank you. Thank you, goodbye.